Hello, everybody. Um, just to let you know, we are waiting for another one or two minutes, I think, until everybody has been able to enter. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I hope you can see my screen and hear me. Let me know if you if you cannot. Um, so welcome everybody to this event and really dialogue about um, mundane media moments, aging the ordinary and everyday life. This event is part of an ongoing conversation around the increasing entanglements of aging with digital technologies that has emerged recently in fields like critical age studies, science and technology studies, media studies, design studies, and other fields, or in short um, and simple, the nascent field of critical studies of aging and technology. In particular, this event is part of an ongoing dialogue between two of, well, what I would say pioneering groups of scholars that populate this nascent field, which is the ACT project and the socio and Technology Network. And I, and I will say a bit more about both of these networks in a minute. My name is Alexander Peine, and I'm the chair of the socio and Technology Network. Kim Sosuk, who is the director of ACT, was to introduce and moderate this event together with me. Um, but unfortunately, she had to cancel her participation due to an urgent family emergency. She sends her regards, of course, and I know that she had a lot to say about and a real passion for today's topic, in particular from her wide expertise in media studies and how the experience of aging has changed with new forms of mediated communications. I will set the scene for today from a slightly different angle based on my own longstanding interest from a background in science and technology studies and critical age studies in particular, um, a longstanding interest in how old age policy, but also during technology design and innovation, evokes and materializes certain ideas about aging and older people. So on this slide, you see two interesting quotes from recent research I did together with uh, Benjamin Lipp on the European silver economy which is one of Europe's strategies to promote new technologies and indeed innovation targeted specifically at older people and aging populations. I find these quotes quite typical for the way innovation policy often positions the life of older people as a canvas for old age technology imaginaries. So what you see here are relations between innovation and cost effectiveness. You see ideas about older people that needs to be supported in remaining active and valued contributors. You see ideas about aging and older adults as valuable resources, as assets in a shrinking labor market, or as providing valuable services. Um, specifically, and I think this is why these quotes are really typical and recognizable across the board of many old age innovation policies globally. What we see here is this assumption the technologies for older people can only be successful um, if they serve a clearly measurable, quantifiable, or otherwise demonstrable benefit or added value. In short, we find here the assumption that technology, when targeted at older people, needs to provide an extra layer of purpose or meaningfulness, often defined by experts, as if the assumption that technology can just be in the life of older people is somewhat dubious or even dingy. Yet, and this is 
been shown by critical studies of aging and technology time and again in empirical studies. Digital practices such as texting, playing online games, scrolling social media, taking photos, these can be part of the daily lives and often they are part of the daily lives of older adults. For these mundane forms of aging technology encounters, however, such an added value as presupposed in many policy discourses and technology initiatives is neither obvious nor clear. Yet these mundane encounters are widespread and as we would argue for today's panel, they do matter. Um, so in the preparation of this event, we really ask ourselves, how do they matter? What, what can we learn from them? And this triggered us in particular to explore in more detail notions um, like banal, trivial, quotidian, insignificant, unnoticeable, unnoticeable, that we often associate with everyday digital practices but which do not seem to have a space in public debates around aging and technology. So today we want to explore these notions, what they mean for our understanding of aging and technology. So what role do these practices play in the lives of older people? How might they transform the ways we research digital practices? In the context of a pandemic, how and where do we situate everyday encounters with technologies that may seem irrelevant? What can we learn from understanding the mundane for all age policies and your own technology design? Is there something like everyday routine use without the mundane, the trivial or the banal? These are questions that we want to address in today's panel from various angles and together with you, and really as a first step in initiating further research and debate. But before we start, I'd like to just quickly say a few words about well, who's behind today's panels, the two groups um, that are meeting here and that, that are presenting, let's say, a snapshot from, from an ongoing dialogue. And on the one hand, we have the Associate Geron Technology Network. And just very briefly, um, what are we? We are a research network, soon gonna be an association. And the idea here is to provide a home for what we call critical scholars in aging and technology. So the idea of a home here is crucial. We are not limited to any particular discipline, but we do include scholars of such diverse backgrounds as STS, critical age studies, media studies, design studies, human computer interaction. But what brings us together really is this idea of being critical, huh? interested in providing alternatives to the dominant techno-optimistic, uh, often business focus, and often also ageist paradigms in current aging technology and innovation policies. And we do this by providing a forum for research, co-creation, sometimes even design on the situated complex nature of aging and technology relations and practice. We are really interested in these modeled realities with the aim of improving the lives of older people and the technological artifacts that populate them. We had our first meeting in 2017. Um, we have had annual meetings ever since. We are organizing smaller workshops and panels just like this one. And we so far have around 100 100 uh, members and we are still counting so if you're interested in this if you think this is really your place for your research and your encounters on aging and technology you're more than welcome to join us um, and the other co-organizer the other lack of the dialogue we are presenting today is uh, the act project aging communication and technology which is a research project and a lab and mostly focused around notions of media studies that explores the transformation of the experiences of aging with the proliferation of new forms of mediated communications in network society. Um, and here a special mandate is this engagement also with local organization and communities of older adults to develop strategies for change. So really also this activist agenda. If you want to find out more about this, there's a website, of course, the ACT Project in Canada. But also if you're interested, and this is really the final sort of wrapping up before we start our discussion, um, we re recently also published a book that emerged from this dialogue, huh, which has been jointly organized by scholars from socio and technology and from, from the ACT project, which is this volume, which we call Interdisciplinary Critical Studies of Aging and Technology, which brings together some of the most interesting, I would say, or the, 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 the relevant theoretical lines of argumentation that 
that emerge from, from critical studies again of aging and technology. So if you want to join our dialogue after today's meetings, go to our website, which you can find here, where you can also find more information about the events that we are organizing, uh, I think mostly after the summer. Um, there's quite, quite a number that, uh, that you may find interesting. Um, but for now, I think it's time to really start our, uh, our panel. We do have four very interesting panelists. And before I introduce them, let me stop sharing my screen. So we have Wendy Martin. Um, hello, Wendy. Wendy is a senior lecturer in the Depart Department of Health Sciences at Brunel University. And her research focuses on aging, embodiment, the digital and everyday life, and the use of visual and digital methods. Our second panelist is Mireya Fernandez Ardefol. Uh, Mireya is a hello, Mireya. Um, Mireya is a senior researcher at the Internet Interdisciplinary Institute at the Open University of Catalonia, where she coordinates the research group Communication Networks and Social Change. Um, we have Galit Nimrod. Hello, Galit. Good to have you here. Galit is a professor and chair at the Department of Communication Studies and Research Fellow at the Center of Multidisciplinary Research in Aging at Ben-Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. And she's aiming to contribute to an understanding of well-being in later life and studies psychological and sociological aspects of leisure, media, and technology use among older adults. And our final panelist is going to be Daniel Lopez. Um, Daniel, hello. Good to see you. Um, Daniel is an associate professor at the Department of Psychology and Education at the University, uh, at the Open University of Catalonia. And he is a full-time researcher at, at the uh, CareNet Research Group there. And he is also an, an experienced ethnographer who works at the intersection of science and technology studies and aging studies. So we are really looking forward to to a number of interesting provocations, but before that, maybe Constance, um, you can tell us a little bit more about how we will organize the discussion that we are about to start. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. And I'm very happy to have everybody here today. Um, so for today, uh, for the discussion, we're going to have the presentations one after the other. So they'll be about 10 minutes in length. And after that, there will be a Q&A period and discussion period. So there are two ways in which you can ask your questions. Uh, so as you might be accustomed to, you can simply write it in the Q&A section, um, which you can find, at least for me, it's in the bottom right of, of my Zoom screen. Um, and then the other way that you might be able to do this is when we get to the question period, you can just raise your hand. And at which point I'm going to invite you to unmute yourself and invite you to just ask your question yourself so you can speak to, uh, to the panelists. Uh, so either one of those will work, do what you're most comfortable with. Uh, there's also the chat function that will remain open throughout, uh, throughout the, the session. So if your questions end up in there by mistake, that's no problem. Uh, I'll monitor both, but you can also respond um, to, to the panelists uh, throughout the presentation or to one another in this format. And then the other thing to note is that we're recording, uh, we're going to be recording this session today. Okay, thanks, uh, Constance. Without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to Wendy. And Wendy is going to talk about situated mundane media moments in everyday life. Wendy, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, thank you, Alex and Constance, and also thank you, thank you to Kim. I know he sadly can't be here, but but we're thinking of you. Um, so thank you all for organising this and. My understanding of the event of what we've been asked to do is, is to make some short presentations of some thoughts or some ideas or some thinking around what the mundane can mean around the media and around the digital. So these, these are just some early thoughts and some, some ways of thinking about some of, the, some of the ways that we could sit, situate the media and the everyday and the mundane in, in our everyday lives. So I first have sort of made one point I, I was going to start with is really most of what we do is mundane. 
um, most of what we do is, is, is routinized, it's ordinary, it's habitual. A lot of what we do is unremarkable. Of course, our lives are punctuated by, by the remarkable, the notable, and through events or experiences. And that's something I'm going to come to talk to because I'm going to talk a little bit about how I believe the mundane has become notable by the, a very remarkable event being the pandemic of COVID-19. For many of us, and I'm sure I, it's not every one of all of us, and of course, one argument I will be making is that a focus on the everyday life and a focus on the mundane um, also reveals inequalities, and I will be talking a little bit more to that, that later. But for many of us who've been in lockdown, our lives have become quite, quite localised, quite mundane, quite every day has become the same. This is conversations that we have. In fact, we worry if we're going to have conversations, what we will talk about, because we have, uh, our, our days have been the same. And so for some of us, we've had uh, significant periods of being in what is called lockdown, which means we've been mainly in our houses and in our locality. So there has been a sense that every day has been the, set, the same. The, the mundane has become our focus. And in fact, the repetition and uh, has become our ordinary and has what has kept us kept us moving day by day. Our days have become daily in every sense of the word. So our rhythms and patterns of, of our everyday life have changed. And we go back, you know, to Giddens work around the existential who always has argued about how we use routines, how we use the habitual, how we use these, these, these ways of our everyday living to, to deal with existential issues many ways by, by focusing on, on, on the mundane and the routine has enabled us to get through a very existential per period through a pandemic. So as I say, it's been quite a remarkable time, a period that we will remember, but actually most of it has been mundane. And this is already, people are already questioning, what will we remember because, because of the sameness and the mundaneness of our everyday lives? And actually, you know, that's something that we, we might want to think about. And I think it's also led to changes in our meanings and perceptions around time, time and space. It's felt different. It's felt very different um, in, you know, being in our locality uh, with every day the same. And how, you know, what well, time in many ways has seemed to disappear because every, every day is the same. We don't have remarkable or notable events to, to punctuate the time. So we have a huge shared memory, but also our own memories within that. I may even argue, potentially, maybe that's something of me being in my late 50s, is, is it's been a return to what we've called the boring. I remember my childhoods, we had, there were, we, we had days we would not have, plan, we did not really have forward plans. A day after day would be very similar. And, um, you know, we, 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 you know, and that was, that was our, our ordinary lives. So what's the role of I'm going to what's the role of the media and what's the role of aging within this? I think the role of the media, and I, I think is one of the things around the mundane, is it I've noticed that the media has become one of our distractions. Whether the, whether we're carrying the digital on our bodies, we have them on our bodies such as Fitbits, whether we have them um, around us um, because we're carrying them, and you know, many of us are carrying our phones even within the house and our iPads, you know, and we're carrying them with us, or whether they're through our screens around us in our local environment. They, 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 they have been, they've punctuated our time by distractions, whether that's watching TV, on our emails and different things. And, and it's also, you know, within our local, um, we bought, you know, it's also linked to a heightened sense of, heightened our senses in many ways. So I think the digital have been there, we've, we've changed our communication, we talk of Zoom fatigue now, and we talk about our everyday life and the, the mundane. But uh, and aware within a heightened awareness of our environment and of our senses in many ways. So, I, as I say, one of my interests, as you put, as you know, is is around um, active aging and the be, being active and, and these discourses of active and, and healthy aging. So, what do, how does a mundane fit in there and in, fit into discourses in which we are required in in discourses to be active? So, I in many ways, if um, if you, I think these sort of ideas around 
the man being mundane, the ordinary and the routinized are, are seen differently and they are different within our dis discourses depending on our age. For a young person, binging all weekend on Netflix is considered entertainment. Um, and it's interesting, I said at weekends and, and, and contextualized in that, and I'm going to come back to that because there are discourses around being productive and unproductive underlying these. But many older people and through many years of doing different, um, different research on active aging, you know, would say, well, goodness, watching TV in the afternoon, I don't know if it's moved to binge or anything, it's, it's a slippery slope. It's considered a naughty, in, in some ways, a shameful. So it's shameful things. So underlying these things and underlying these discourses is the productive time and productive space. There is something that underlying these discourses of mundane about whether the mundane is being productive or whether it's being unproductive. So we must never uh, uh, underestimate the value judgments and the focus that has always been around these aspects. Les Back has written about the everyday life and, and the methodological aspects and, and in the context of inequalities. And, and this paper, if you haven't read it, is a very interesting paper. But he says, the, what the focus on the everyday life enables us to have an eye for this seemingly unimportant. The first reason why everyday life matters, it, matter, it makes us take the mundane seriously. And he argues as researchers that it is through our creative methods and our methodologies and our theoretical perspectives that we can have, we can bring detail and we can bring detail and interest and focus into the world of, of, of everyday life in this world. So just, I'm using, I, for the, uh, this is the final part of, of what, what my presentation. I'm going, um, I'm these are images from my project, The Photographing Everyday Life, in which people took photographs of their everyday life, in which they, in which they, the, 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 the digital is situated and the, and the routine is situated. Of course, when we talk about the media and the digital, these, these are objects, often objects, either, as I say, on our person, around our person, our local environment, but they're dispersed around other objects. And we have this, they also dispersed around other activities and other practices that we do in our everyday life. They therefore focus, the focus on the mundane reminds us therefore of the materiality of the digital and how, how our everyday fabric of our everyday lives is significant, how it, how it links into our space, how it links into our times. A focus on the mundane and the, the everydayness of our life is around being connected. In some of these maybe our everyday connect, connections, I think sometimes the digital have made these overwhelming at times, they can also be um, our mobility, they can also be our distractions. Often we can also, as I said before, we can fill up time using these digitals in terms of the mundane. At times, you know, when we've had long periods of recent times, you know, of experiencing at times boredom, the digital have become a way of filling in and distracting us. And, and maybe I'm speaking for myself, um, I find myself for a moment of quietness and there I am looking at my iPhone, going looking at my iPad. The digital is there in, that, in the background at all times. But the mundane also makes us think about, the, about our, um, how it's situated within other practices. It's not separated from the dailiness of our life. So our other activities of doing housework, of caring for having our pets and friends around, uh, our everyday activities of doing exercise, of getting up, going to bed. The, 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 the digital is throughout these days and the media, and particularly as it becomes more and more mobile, is throughout the, 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 our everyday routinized practices. So just to conclude, I just want to say that as researchers, I think it would be, I'm so looking forward to hearing um, different views on the mundane. It's a really, really important aspect for us to think about, to also think about what it says about growing older and those moral judgments that also come from, 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 from the everyday and how we see, see older and younger people and people through the life course differently. But then also for us as re researchers, I think it enables us to go deeper and to be more creative, um, as Les Back always reminds us, to think about, the, you know, to, to, to reveal the inequalities and re reveal difference as well. 
through by, by looking at the everyday mundane. So thank you, Alex. I need to unmute myself, of course. Uh, thanks, Wendy. Um, great presentation. Um, also, I think without further ado, just to open up the floor for different opinions here on, on, or different different views and different facets of the mundane. Um, Mireya, I think the floor is yours. Just take it from here. Um, her, yeah. Mireya's speech is going to be about the unnoticeable untold digital practices. <clears throat> Okay, not clear what you can see. So maybe I made a wrong. Can you see my presentation? No. It looks great. Yeah, good. Okay, good. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk about the untold practices, things that you do, but you don't talk anymore about them or things that you stop doing. And to introduce the issue, I'm gonna talk about ordinary questions as well. Like, did you check in with whoever today? Did you talk to them? Did you call them? These are tiny, tiny, tiny activities that are part of our mundane everyday life. And we can meet these communication goals, these particular communication goals, we can meet them in a different, different amount of different ways, in, in a big range, range of different ways. So my question is not only about the activity, it's about the channels we use. And in here, if we take, for example, ways of checking in, of course we can check in by meeting somebody face-to-face, something that during the lockdown was not possible, but we can call, we can set up a video call. Uh, indeed, uh, we have a number, a number of ways of performing the activities that are in this list. And we can distinguish between video calls and voice calls, but also between what in some countries we are gonna call texting, but in other places we are gonna call messaging. And of course, messages could be also multimedia messages, images, short voice messages, short videos. So we, we have a bunch of possibilities and as well, we can perform these activities through different media being a phone, a landline phone, a mobile phone, a smartphone, a tablet, a computer, but also we can perform this task on Facebook, through WhatsApp, on Twitter and Instagram. So this small ordinary question, did you, did you check in with whoever today, indeed can open a list of activities in digital channels that illustrate the richness of the context in which we live. So, and the point here, and this is uh, to me, the relevant point is that we make content, constant choices regarding what channels do we wanna use to perform the very same communication task. And we face restrictions as when we had to face the lockdown, so we couldn't meet face to face, but we face other kind of restrictions as bad internet connection or very high mobile communication prices. But we also have resources at hand like when mobile communication prices are affordable in my place or when devices or platforms are really affordable, are really easy to use, and then you move in there because your environment is moving into this, uh, these uh, places as places of communication. So this simple question about, did you check today with somebody? can again can be 
a bunch of very, very different things. And the communication goal is the very same. The point is that we have this ever-changing digital landscape that is shaped by this trend of accelerated innovation. We are living in this situation now. Maybe this is gonna stop at some point, but from the very beginning of the pandemic until now, we've been through an even more exacerbated digital changing landscape. So we didn't use terms as Zoom fatigue a couple of months ago, then we learn what Zoom is. Now most of most people live on Zoom. And of course, Zoom is just another platform. And of course, Skype already existed, but they don't really work the same. And, and they bring affordances and they shape the way we relate to other individuals because of the way they are designed. So they are shaping what we do. They 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 create environments that allow us uh, to communicate in one way or in another. And within this landscape, we have different communication practices that adapt to our vital circumstances and, um, and we move with them. We, we go with the flow. So we used to text. A couple of years ago, we started texting. We get back to writing an activity that was supposed to gonna get lost at some point. Uh, now we write more than ever for very ordinary and mundane activities. We write a lot, but we are also learning to communicate in these mundane small talks minimal messages that are really everyday life organization things, we are starting to get back to voice communication because technically speaking, the system allows us to do that in a very easy way that is affordable in every term, in usability terms and also in economic terms. And this means that some practices that become stable are also practices that are not told. They are there. So I can say, I text somebody today to check in. However, what does texting really mean in this case? This is to me the question. As I'm interested in the practices themselves, not only in the communication goal, but I'm interested in the practices because they are associated with different stages of life. Our communication goals change with life because we don't have the same communication needs when we are 10 years old, when we are 30 years old, when we are 50, when we are 60. So we need to understand that this is not a steady activity communication. It's something that is gonna be different through life because our life circumstances change. So if we don't talk about this activity anymore, if, if we don't mention anymore that our messages are going through WhatsApp, or if we don't mention, and this is what we found in, in a qualitative research through focus group, that Facebook is not mentioned anymore. So you need to really ask whether Facebook is in their landscape of communication instruments people have in their everyday life. If they are not told, how can we learn? How can we identify them and analyze them? And to me, this is a relevant question, mostly when you approach this kind of uh, exploration from a survey perspective, from a quantitative perspective, where you need to really get very precise questions that are not going to get the respondent tired of for the same. I mean, I, you cannot ask every channel to everyone. So where do you want to go? What is what is the relevant thing that, for instance, WhatsApp is providing the final user versus Facebook? Or why Zoom became that popular versus Skype? And what are the different affordances we have here? In, 
So this to me is a tremendously relevant question and I link it, I link it to a research we conducted in, in, in Toronto that ended up in, in this uh, paper um, entitled Maintaining Connections. And in this case, this was a qualitative research with opto and non in in uh, retirement homes. And we talk about digital use and non-use. And a very, very interesting result from this paper is that the fact that there is a, a continuum between use and non-use, these are not binary. These are not binary categories. We cannot consider them binary. Think about your uses, your digital uses when we were totally confined, how they have changed. But this doesn't mean that we have abandoned every practice we had at that point, but they have changed. And in this case, the fact that we were talking with with uh, individuals age 80 years, 90 years old, act, um, made us able to identify how connecting was relevant for those individuals, but individuals filter what they use and what they don't use. We do this at every point of our life, but in this case, their examples were way more clearer. And they were, sir, they, they circumscribe what they did depending on their vital evolution. So at some point you have the agency of saying enough, I don't want this anymore in my life. And I think this is agency. It's not that you, you are weak, you are strong enough to say, I'm done with that. So, and, I, and this is my, my last slide. All this reflection brings me towards some questions that are relevant in pandemic times. So what are the practices we introduced, we learned, or older individuals learned and introduced during lockdowns? What are those practices and are they kept or are they discarded and why? What are, what are the motivations of keeping some of those practices or discarding them? What are the meanings of those practices? And if they are kept and they have become ordinary, how can we learn about them if they just turn almost invisible? And uh, with this question, I'll stop my, my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mireya. I think we are, we are already heading towards a very nice tapestry of, of the mundane. No? When, when this presentation, we saw these, well, the muddled realities, the messiness of the mundane, and, um, that Mireya was talking about the normalization of digital practices, which makes them unnoticeable as such. Um, and I think that's also really relevant in relation to how we discuss innovation no? sometimes, like the digital as alien to, well, if, if we keep continue talking about the digital as innovative, um, th then we make these practices unnoticeable because they have become so normalized. So I, I found this really intriguing. Um, so a lot of good elements for discussion already here, but uh, I'd like to give the floor to our next speaker, um, hopefully yet add, adding another uh, aspect of, uh, of this tapestry of the mundane. So Galit um, will talk about technology and casual leisure in, in old age. Um, so please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alex, and thank you also Constance and Kim for the invitation to participate in this discussion. Um, let me just share my slides. Mm -hmm. I assume that you can see them, right? Okay. Um, so the term that I want to bring into our discussion today is casual leisure. And I think that to some extent it can answer some of the questions that Mireya just posed. But before I explain what uh, casual leisure is, I want to start with uh, presenting one finding out of one project, out of many, many projects that we had in the framework of ACT. And the project that I'm going to talk about is the Grannies on the Internet project. Um, in this project, we had uh, 27 focus groups um, with grandmothers from seven countries, from Canada, Colombia, Israel, Italy, Peru, Romania, and Spain. 
And we interviewed um, 184 grandmothers age 65 and over who use ICT at least uh, to some extent. One of the papers that came out of that project um, explored the roles technology plays in leisure. And I don't want to go too much into introduction of what leisure is, but generally when we look at definitions of leisure, it has three uh, main components. One is time, the other one is activity, and the third one is experience. Time typically refers to free time, the time that is left after we're done doing all the things that we're supposed to do. So it means that we have more freedom to do, um, um, to choose what we do in our leisure. Activity refers to what we actually do in our free time and experience is a dimension referring to a certain state of mind that we have during leisure. And it also relates to the outcomes of the activity that we participate in. Typically, this, the best outcomes are positive. We enjoy leisure, but also we should remember that some leisure activities uh, can also hold some negative experiences. So this is just something to remember. In our study, we found that uh, the roles uh, technology plays in leisure and later life are, are actually affect all three defining uh, aspects of leisure. ICT both saves, saves time, but also co may cause to the waste of time. ICTs also support participating in uh, different activities, but they can also distract involvement in certain activities. And in terms of experience, we found that ICTs uh, provide both meaningful experiences and also something that we termed as time fillers. And this is the part that I want to focus on. Time fillers are different from the meaningful full experiences by being considered by the participant themselves as insignificant. Involvement in activities that were described as time fillers typically ended when the time that needed filling was over. And the most prevalent fillers were game playing like Sudoku and Candy Crush, listening to music, uh, either by listening to YouTube or Spotify or stuff like that texting and aimless surfing. Uh, time fillers were used both under extreme constraints and in various everyday situations. Extreme constraints included, for example, uh, times like Pentecost and some one of the um, respondents told us that during that time, she was not allowed to do anything for three days and she gets sick because um, she can't knit and she can't do anything else, so she plays games. Uh, another person uh, told us that she had a severe car accident after which she was hospitalized for uh, eight months. And during that time, she had several surgeries and she said that after one of the surgeries, she couldn't move a hand or a leg. So she used iPad to watch TED Talks, listen to music and do all kinds of things. Time fillers are ever where way more common in various everyday situations, such as while well, being in bed before going to sleep instead of watching TV, um, while using uh, public transportation, it was a good way to kill time, while waiting for a doctor's appointment or during commercial breaks, that's just something to do to, while you're waiting for the program to continue. And also um, some person said that they do use time fillers who are being involved simultaneously in other activities. And this is one of the quotes that I thought were brilliant. One person told us, when I talk on the phone, I play all kinds of games on the computer to avoid wasting time. Now, what I want to argue here that is that time fillers provide older ICT user, users with casual leisure. Casual leisure uh, was defined by Stebbins, who is one of the most prominent and definitely one of the most productive scholars in the field of leisure studies as immediately intrinsically rewarding, relatively shortly pleasurable activity requiring little or no special training to enjoy it. 
Sabine's also talked about types of, of casual leisure and it included play, um, relaxation, things like sitting, napping, strolling, passive entertainment, like watching TV, reading books, listening to music, active entertainment, like playing games of chess and party games, sociable conversation and sensory stimulation, such as sex, eating and drinking. Now, the four time fillers that we found in our study definitely belong into these uh, three categories. Uh, listening to music is passive entertainment as, as well as um, aimless surfing. Games can be uh, defined as active entertainment. And of course, texting is a type of social conversation. Now, one thing that you should know about casual leisure is that it is perceived as inferior to serious leisure, uh, which is a an amateur hobbyist or volunteer core activity, which participants find a career, a leisure career, in which they acquire and express skills, knowledge, and experience. Now, serious leisure uh, is a main um, concept in leisure studies, and especially when um, uh, studying older people, because it can offer to some extent a substitution of work career. <clears throat> either by uh, enabling people to develop some kind of creative um, uh, talent or, or some kind of uh, sports or volunteering. All these activities can actually provide some kind of substitution. And sometimes this substitution is even more satisfying and meaningful than any job a person did during their um, work life. However, it is important to remember that casual leisure too is an important is important in personal and social life. And Stebbins describes several kinds of benefits of casual leisure, such as creativity and discovery, edutainment, distraction and regeneration, development and maintenance of interpersonal relationships, and sense of achievement and appreciation of beauty. And if you just think about time fillers I mentioned earlier, like listening to music can be an appreciation of beauty. Or if you play games and you succeed, you can feel achievement. Or if you read something on the internet, it can be can yield discovery and entertainment. And uh, if you do all that while you're in the hospital or waiting for a doctor's appointment, it can definitely provide some kind of distraction and, and so forth. Uh, several studies actually looked at the benefits of casual leisure in old age and they discovered more benefits that are more specific for older people, such as stimulation of the senses, uh, a sense of flow, enhanced mood, positive outlook, reduced stress, and even resilience to negative life events. This shows that casual leisure can be very, very beneficial in general and in old age in particular. So what I would like to argue here, and I would love to discuss it more later, is that by offering casual leisure experiences, ICT-based time fillers turn mundane moments into fun moments. And though they are perceived and may be perceived by participants and by people who are involved in them as insignificant, they can and may promote well-being in old age. So I would suggest that insignificant media moments should be considered more seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Galit. Um, and I think a very puzzling question at the end, how to, well, how to treat something as significant whose who's, who's essence is insignificant. So I think that's, that's really, a, well, that's, that's a really interesting puzzle in relation to, well, what, what could we do with that? Um, and how could we relate it to, well, policy making, for instance. Um, but we'll, we'll have our final speaker. Um, again, yet another, another piece of the puzzle, uh, hopefully, Daniel. Um, Daniel will talk about memes and pandemic times, from digital clutter to mutual support infrastructures for older people. Um, so Daniel, please, the floor is yours. Can you see the picture, right? Okay, thank you for the invitation and uh, 
giving me the opportunity to share some some thoughts about my work. But in, in that occasion, I, I'm, I'm not going to present uh, research results. But it's this is more like uh, probably ethnographic insights or ethnographic reflections based on my experience uh, volunteering and intervening in the field. Uh, so it's more like my 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 role as social psychologist uh, doing some work during the pandemic. So. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about a very mundane media practice, which is uh, sharing memes, uh, pictures, and anything that may seem amusing, interesting, or curious on a social platform, which is what we normally do, and we spend most of our time doing this kind of stuff. So it's very mundane. Uh, but in particular, I want to reflect upon the ambivalent character of the banality, the banality of this practice, when these practices are conducted by older people living alone in the midst of a pandemic that looked them down at home. So when they were really like, they couldn't go out, the, the families were out. So the, the, the only way to interact for most of them was through a digital platform or, through, or, by, or by telephone. From May to June uh, 2020, I joined Binkless as a volunteer. A wing class was created by the Barcelona City Council to prevent loneliness in later life. The service provides a tablet with an app for free where it is possible to interact with people living in the same district or with similar interests. So it is organized through different channels. Uh, the interface is very simple and functional. Users can post images, videos, text, and audio messages, and then they are displayed. These messages are displayed in a conversation thread, so it's like a forum. The City Council asked our professional advice on how to provide, provide better support to the users when the lockdown began. So being less social workers, the professionals working there, whose work was mainly to moderate participation in the channels and organize activities to foster social interaction, was actually providing, you know, uh, casual leisure activities to, to the user most of the, of the time. So, but now they, 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 they were facing a different situation. So they, need, they needed to respond to some pandemic uh, related demands from the users. So that, that, that was quite overwhelming for them because people were dying. People were like uh, in a very anxious about, about the future. So they were, they were uh, providing actually more like psychosocial uh, support for, for to the users. So together with Israel Rodriguez, who is also a researcher at work and expert in disaster, we proposed to setting up a channel, specific channel to foster mutual support and solidarity related to the pandemic. So the idea was that they could find a place to talk and eventually support each other, for instance, by exchanging tips and advices on how they were coping with the situation. Our role was also to identify problems and provide professional support if they need it or request it. So we, we decided to first call the channel collective uh, support. Uh, and it the, cha the channel comprised uh, 27 groups, one per district, with more than 50 users per, per group. In one of the groups, uh, that the dynamic, social dyna dynamic we proposed did not take traction. Uh, the first two days uh, of that group, uh, two, only two people posted text messages, complaining about the situation and expressing feelings of solitude and hopeless. But suddenly after this, these two messages, the conversation thread got filled with images, memes and videos, and it was impossible for us to steer it toward a different kind of interaction, the one that we wanted to promote. As we were told later by Pinkler social workers, these media artifacts, so the, the memes and the, the images had colonized the conversations because a particular type of user took over the group. They were experienced users of Pinkless who love to share anything they find interesting and amusing across channels, regardless of the purpose of the channel. This, uh, this is what, uh, for them, what, doing that was the most entertaining thing. 
and also uh, a particular way of understanding their contribution to being to Binkless. So the idea was for them to make Binkless a very lively and engaging space through the constant uh, posting of images and videos and things like that. But Binkless social workers also uh, told us that these media practices were causing technical troubles as the app uh, automatically uh, stores any image that is rendered visible, the tablet rapidly runs out of memory if the user engage in this kind of interaction. The situation was even more critical because some users got disconnected from Binkless and no one could go to their places to free up the tablet's memory. So when technology was more necessary than ever to connect with others, some users got even more isolated than ever because these media practices generated an increasing amount of digital clutter that ended up breaking up the technological infrastructure. On top of that, these practices also bothered us uh, because we believed that they were hampering the generation of solidarity bonds, which would have required a more personal engagement. In that group, almost no one spoke about what was happening nor share the ex personal experiences. Hardly anyone commented on anything about the impact of the pandemic, uh, pandemic in their lives or the measures the government were taking. Throughout the period in which I was collaborating with, uh, with the service, so around three months, this group dynamic uh, never changed. The same people kept posting the same kind of images on a daily basis, almost as a routine. But then I realized after a while, uh, that this was uh, very significant for them. They were not specially interested in talking about strange things that they were living now, nor how, they how their lives had been transformed. It was all about celebrating that a new day is always coming. It became more and more evident that the banality of the memes were part of a practice of mutual digital support. The memes were always nice, emotional, plenty of hope and always pointing to beautiful things in such catastrophic times it was clear that saying nice things to yourselves and to others was a form of care also i realized that these memes were far more inclusive for some people than sending text uh, sending text or audio messages they were easy to share these images got saved in the your tablet so you only need to pick one and share it they also make interactions much more fluid and open to new participants. Text and audio messages were certainly much more personal and touching, but very, mu very much time consuming and attention demanding. You need to focus on them and spend time reading and listening. For some people, this was too much. They were going through very tough situations and were not up for the task. Moreover, quite a number of people mostly low educated, did not feel comfortable writing and speaking in public. In some, given the circumstances, very tough circumstances, sharing memes and image, these kind of images seem to be an easy way to make you feel that you were not alone. This generated a, a continuous co-presence effect that was easy to maintain and was pretty inclusive. This continuous co-presence also generated mutual support Posting images was also a way to let people know that you are doing fine. If you stop doing it, people might worry and try to do something to help you. Saying in return that you love that picture was also a way to say, I'm doing okay, and I'm here in case you need something. In sum, the ambivalent character of the banality of these media artifacts puzzled me during that time in a context where social life went digital sharing images turned out to be a source of digital clutter, quite dangerous for some because they contributed to break down the technological infrastructure that hold them together, thus increasing the digital isolations of some users. But I also learned to appreciate <coughs> the value of these media artifacts as emergency infrastructures of social connectivity and support, which for some were much more inclusive and attuned to how they were experiencing and coping with the pandemic. <clears throat> Susan Leistar's work on the notion of infrastructures allows us to conceptualize this ambivalence, this ambivalence of, the, of the mundanity of these uh, practices. 
She considers the study of infrastructures as the study of boring things, which are usually the technical and material elements that support and organize our social activity, protocols, standards, systems. Infrastructures are embedded in action, and for this reason, they tend to be, uh, they tend to be the unseen. The study of, of infrastructures does not produce anthropological strangeness as occur, as occurs with the exotic but an embedded strangeness because it's about, it is about the forgotten that must remain forgotten to work. The study of it, as uh, Poker says, is to make an infrastructural, infrastructural inversion. We see this, um, this uh, embed, embedded and invisible, visible character of the infrastructures in the memes. They are not just messages with meaning, but they are data that wait that needs to be processed, that, that, that therefore requires telecommunication networks and tablets with enough memory. These technical systems enable certain forms of communication. And we normally take for granted that they work, but uh, as, we as we can see with the memes, they can collapse quite uh, easily. Second, infrastructures are always relational. What for some is something that supports a, ser a series of practice and is embedded and invisible. For others, it is visible because it becomes an obstacle, a problem. For this reason, talking about infrastructures is talking about power. For us, and in a way also for pinkless social workers, these images turn into digital clutter. They interfered in the dynamics of the groups. They hindered the type of relationships we wanted to promote. So for, the, for, for us, that was clear a problem. They were really, really visible. But on the other hand, for the users of the group, they were elements that allowed certain type of mutual care at a distance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, um, for, uh, for this last piece of the puzzle. And really, I think this notion of infrastructure is also relates really well because it extends, well, that extends the mundane and the unnoticeable into, well, far deeper into the material environments as well. I think that's also really interesting conceptual impetus. Um, but I'd like to open the, f the, the floor, the discussion now to, to the floor. Um, so as Constance already mentioned, um, we now have the opportunity to raise questions or make propositions in relation to how we should well, look at the mundane. Um, so please raise your hand so we will keep an eye on that. Or you can also use the chat uh, to type your questions um, and really see this as, as a discussion around this. Um, I can maybe ask you to start a question while, while people are thinking of their own questions and, and putting things in the chat. First of all, thank you, everyone. That was really, really interesting. Um, I think my question maybe is around the capitalist push for making technologies mundane, right? So there's, there's an incentive for technologies to become mundane. Um, a lot of the mundane technologies that, that you all discussed today make a lot of demands on users. So whether it be personal data, um, tracking of, 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 kind of behaviors online. So I'd like to hear everyone about this and what does it mean? And, and it touches a bit with Dan what Danielle was just saying, but what does it mean for these kinds of um, demands to be incorporated in the mundane? Is this a legitimate expectations that we would have of older adults? And how does this connect in particular to the, the futures of older adults, especially understanding that there's an increasing push towards making the technologies of care part of the mundane for a lot of individuals. Um, shall, shall I start? Thanks, Constance. <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Yeah, I mean, I, we, we, we just had a short period to say something, but I think um, the tracking of data and, and, and our I mean, the other, other part I was thinking of talking about is, is the wearables and things like that, the way we wear them and they can, or, or, or they're with our bodies, you know, as I was saying, you know, even our iPads and 
and, and things are getting smaller and more and more invisible to they're with us and then we use the data and then we, we we link it into our everyday lives you know the real intimate parts of our everyday lives so that can be tracking ourselves or being tracked by others and whether that's um um you know when we know about it or whether we don't know about it um we are often being tracked as well and you're right there is a whole silver economy coming there and you know i you know i always often think about this you know the you know um and how the infrastructure i mean um i think barb marshall's on the board we were, we were at the end of the other day we were looking at the um at the images around care and future futures of care and how the technologies within within the homes or around the person are becoming more and more invisible, but actually becoming more, more and more required because in sense of people's ideas around risk. And so therefore, you know, are these technologies about increasing independence or freedoms or is it about increasing surveillance of old people? So I think it's around the capitalism is central to that, of course, because they've come in on the market now. I would say Constant, but there is like a double double trend in here. When it's about innovation and making things look as they are thrilling, that it is great to jump into the new product in a constant, again, this constant path of innovation. So it, you, and the, I mean, from a consumerism, consumeristic point of view and capitalistic point of view, is pushing you towards the new device. And at the same time, what you were mentioning, data capitalism not being told. So it's the boring part, the part that is, uh, you don't need to take care of, but it's gonna be there. So you, I think there's like a double side of, of, of what you mentioned. So on the one side is, is that, to, make you keep consuming you need to have the latest uh innovation and you need to be always you know the changing what you do and the ways you do so you look modern and sometimes this is a particular challenge at, at given ages both because you don't want to move to the next stage of this technology or because whatever reason yeah, but on the other hand, is is the other side that is mundane, that is not going to be told, but your data is kept, and then some business is done with this data. Can I say something mm -hmm. uh, about, yeah, I think Constance's question is, I think, really to the point, I, because uh, at least in my experience, I mean, uh, normally, you know, the question is why, how mundanity is maintained in a way. It's like, it, it requires a lot of work as you, 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 you were saying. And, and, and the thing is that this, the, and this is Leistahl's uh, approach is this work that is normally necessary to keep technology running as something mundane uh, needs to be invisible, needs to remain invisible. And, uh, and, 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 and the thing is that, that I think it's a more a political question is how to, how to make visible that work, and 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 uh, because then uh, you see the the idea of technology as solution, you know the plug the plug and play imaginary of technology dissolves is something that is a challenge because of that because I say okay, okay this app it works really smoothly but th this entails that that I do a lot of work you know apply, uploading things for example in that case uploading images. Uh, reacting all the time to what other users are saying. So I, I need to keep, to keep you know, the, 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 the channel uh, alive in a way, so li a lively environment. So th this requires a lot of work. And, uh, and, and I think that, that that is a political question is how, well, how to make that work visible and how the, then it's visible how this work is distributed among the participants. And this is also an, another political question. So yeah, thanks for the for the question. I'll take the risk of being a bit techno optimist. I know it's like a curse in this group, <laughs> uh, but I would like to suggest to consider mundane media moments as an opportunity. And I think that the key word here would be choice. Okay, 
And, and this is something that we should all remember that people do have the choice. And of course, we will never uh, endorse automatic, you know, just take out your phone whenever you're alone or bored or whatever you have time to kill or, or something like that. Uh, but I do think, and it, it, it goes back to your question earlier, Alexander, how can we take uh, um, mundane media moments more seriously and what the effect it can have, um, like the knowledge that we bring? And I think that first of all, um, maybe we should consider this session a call for more serious research on mundane media moments. And, and we should definitely look um, more into the experience of older people and their media moments, okay? Um, like what Danielle just said, I, I consider about the memes and posting images, I, I see that as an opportunity for some kind of communal coping, okay? So there are positives and we should never forget them, even though we always bring in the risks and the, the dangers and, and, you know, the critical angle. Uh, so I, definitely this is something that we should study more uh, seriously and into, into depth. Uh, but also I'm, I'm thinking about taking it further into more practical implications. So these are things that should be considered in any training of when we, when we train older people to use ICT. This is something that we should consider both the risks but the opportunities. And even in terms of policies, you know, Alex, you said earlier, what can we do with that in terms of policy? Um, so I'm thinking about the research that Constance and Kim and others did in Canada, and we learned from them about the costs of, of mobile phone um, communication. And, and it's really, really expensive in Canada. So maybe if one of our studies demonstrate the benefits and the opportunities that are there in mobile communication that people can use while being in transport or in a hospital or wherever, there is a case there to argue that costs for older people should be maybe lower, okay? And this is just one thought that we can of course develop it, but I wouldn't want us to forget the opportunities that are there in, in mundane media moments. And I, maybe I can relate to this because I think this is a really interesting discussion and I think whether or not it's techno optimist or pessimist, that in the end, that's not the, the, the interesting question. The interesting question is the empirics of this or what we observe if we look at, well, either these mundane practices or the policy discourses. And I, what, what strikes me in this discussion is really also that even if we look at this sort of the, the capitalist innovation discourse around technology on the one hand and aging on the other, I think we really have these sort of crisscrossing on the one hand, if it's made very explicitly for, for older people and be an intervention and solve problems, then there's always the connection to these very unmundane practices, like something that's beneficial for your health and something that can be measured. While at the same time, there's also this whole discourse, in particular, if we talk about surveillance, that these technologies need to be insignificant and they need to become infrastructure and background. And well, that there, there's the whole surveillance capitalism discourse here. And I think there's a lot we can say from these types of research in repositioning the whole notions of, well, unnoticeably or insignificant or, 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 or mundane in relation to these discourses. And for me, this is really one of the, the strong elements of being critical as well. It's like being very well what to criticize and where to also provide more reflection. And, I, I think this already brings out the, the very different lines of things because we, we did have both of these lines here also showing that the mundane is actually something that, well, it may not be that mundane after all. And well, you get in all sorts of infinite regresses when you try to, to, to even discuss this. But I think there's a lot to this uh, here as well in relation to, well, innovation policy, capitalism and, and so forth. Um, so that's certainly a line of, of discussion I, I think would be great to have also in the future. Um, we do have other questions though in the chat and probably we also need to, we need to turn to those. Um, Constance, do you want to read them? Shall I read them? What, what? Uh, I can bring one by Soledad Caballero. Um, so she thanks everyone for their presentations. 
Uh, she also would like to ask Mireya to further develop her um, her conceptualization of use and, and non-use binary, her critique of that. Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sole. Nice to see you around indeed. Um, in, in commonly, in when, when we do statistics and we try to classify use and non-use and the digital device, divide, we are gonna talk about those who have access and those who don't, and uh, those who use and those who don't use. And so this is a binary, uh, variable is yes or no. Do you use the internet? Yes or not? Do you use WhatsApp? Do you use Facebook? Yes or not? What we found in this particular case study is that your relationship with the internet, with mobile phones, with uh, particular platforms is not necessarily white or black, yes or no, but it can change through time. So you can't stop using the email. And when it comes, when a good reason is there, you're gonna get back to the email. And I think we're gonna see this now really, really clearly with the practices we set up during lockdowns that we, maybe some of them, they are gonna disappear, but they, some might disappear for a while and then we're gonna get back to them. So by, Assuming that there is a continuum in the use non use classification in the traditional one, but I'm not saying that we don't have to use it anymore. It's useful, but for given circumstances, it's good to look at this distinction from a continuous. Uh, it's, it's a continuum. It's nothing that is going to happen forever because our relationship with different digital technologies is nothing that is, you know, stamped with fire in our lives. So Today I'm gonna do that, but maybe tomorrow I'm gonna change my mind and then the other week I'm gonna change it again. And through life we change this relationship. And sometimes I am gonna be a user of whatever, but then I'm gonna stop. This is why we criticize these, these um, binary, binary approach to use and non-use of digital technology. I hope this, hope this clarifies. Thank you, Mireya. Um, I think we have another question in the chat. And then also, I think uh, we have one question from the audience, one raised hand. But maybe we can first turn to the, the, the second question in the chat. Sure. So, and we've got a few in the Q&As as well, uh, Alex. Um, oh, so, <laughs> so oh, that's hi, true. Loredana, uh, Ivan, so she's asking, whether there are different layers in using technology from moments where people are using different technologies without being aware of it, as Mireya uh, presented, to incorporating technologies in FADIC interactions as Danielle presented. For example, sending a meme instead of saying hello. Uh, I'd like to say thank you, Mireya, for this question. Because <laughs> uh, actually your question is exactly what I, I'm trying to argue here, that we really don't know enough about um, mundane media moments. Maybe it is like there are layers, maybe there is a continuum of, of media moments. And, and we, we just get a bite here from the different uh, uh, presentations of mo what mundane media moments are, but there is so much that is still needed to be explored and, and studied and, and you know looking at the positive and the negative and all that is still pretty unexplored at the moment. So I'm not sure that any of us can answer your question, but I think it's a great, great question for, for further research. I suppose just to add, I suppose if we think about taking for granted things that we don't notice in terms of our routines in everyday life. Is, is when there are disruptions or there's something specific. I mean, we can be on our laptop, you know, for hours not noticing it or losing ourselves for hours of doing something on the media and just, you know, just in, 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 you know, in absent and, and just take it for granted. And then there's a heightened awareness of things for different reasons that may be disruptions or, or something new or something different or just something that we think, you know, we're thinking about. So I suppose that there are probably layers or there's probably, or probably awareness and layers of awareness. I, I imagine, I mean, that would be my.
Uh, yeah, Wendy, and this links with your idea that what are we going to remember from the particular time of the lockdowns, what is remarkable and what is not. So what becomes really, really mundane that we are not going to even talk about it. It's not going to be in, in our, in the way we are going to talk about this time, this period of time. Yeah, I think this is relevant. Uh, thank you. Um, I can I can bring the other question, which I think connects to one of the questions that we also have uh, in in the Q and A. So the question by Unmil and also the question by Andrea. Um, so Unmil is asking um, the critical role of these mundane technology moments in older adults' life is clear from your presentation. Given this criticality. Um, I wonder whether there is a passive of or overt demand for some older adults who depend on memes or messages from others and conversely pressure on others like frequent posters who consider it as work. And then the other kind of question that Andrea brings to the floor is also thinking about um, people who don't necessarily have the means to access technology. So thinking specifically, if the panelists can also share their thoughts about those kinds of situations and um, the, the, those who don't have the capacity, uh, financial or otherwise, to participate in these so-called mundane activities. Can I answer Umil first? Yes. Sure. Okay. Uh, um, my point with the meme sharing and the request or the pressure of those for whom memes are that important for you to share them, I think is, is a point of perception of what is relevant or not. I mean, the, the experience Daniel shared with us is, is a clear case of taking in and, and, and for some people, this is so relevant. The point is that the relevance of this practice is perceived differently, in this case, among different individuals in different generations. Because for other generations and for other groups, what is relevant is something different. So the dynamics through, through sharing of memes that look that they are they have no substance at all because they are good morning, good day, whatever, flowers and cats and those things, they are so relevant. And I, and I think the point is understanding why they are relevant for some people and they are not relevant for other people. And here to me, what it comes is the understanding that each group of people, in this case, maybe we can make distinctions by age. I'm not clear if this could be the best way of doing that. But for some generations or for some group of people, these are relevant and meaningful practices that are not further. And then when, when you mix those different relevancies, it, be, it comes the conflict. Like you are not sharing enough memes with me. And then you're thinking like, oh, this person is a spammer and keeps sharing with me this kind of, of, of elements. And then regarding the other question by Andrea on, on what happens with people who are not able to, because they don't have the means or the economic capacity, my experience is there are two ways of facing that. I don't care. This means nothing to me. So this is not a kind of technology I wanna use. I don't want to use that. And the other one is the contrary, I would like to. And this, this is the problematic one. So the one when you would like to use and you are not able to because you have economic constraints. And for those cases, we need to face this and in um, public policies or whatever, just face this and, and, and help the situation to be overcome and break the digital divide. I would like to add just to answer these two questions that are kind of work together that we did have another project in ACT that explored techno stress in, in later life. And techno stress is a multi-dimensional construct and it has both the pressure of learning and keeping up to date with technology on one hand, but also the pressure of answering and replying 
hosting and all that stuff that people who use ICT are required to do. And uh, what we found in that study is that the people that are older people that are most vulnerable to techno stress are those who are first older, okay, and that use technology to a lesser extent. They have less experience, they have less skills, they use less functions, okay. So there's a definitely a risk there. So when we talk about mundane media moments and, and media uses, we should always keep in mind that media use does not always provide opportunities, but also there are risks and uh, risks and techno stress is definitely one of the greatest risks because it does harm well-being. And, and I mean, there's a lot of literature about that, but this is something to remember. I would like to add something Daniel? about uh, uh, Amil's question, I think. Uh, and I think it, it relates to Stephen's question that is in the in the other chat yeah <laughs> yeah I, and i think it's a very nice question I'm, and i think also relates to galit's presentation in terms of how, how to distinguish or how to differentiate leisure and work and you know when we need to label or categorize you know social activities in different categories and i i think it's a it's a it's an empirical question it's a, and I'm, I'm taking i'm drawing on on uh, Laystar again and the, the nomatology and sociology of, of everyday life uh, point that is uh, important to explore in the situation, in the specific situations, what are the elements that define an activity in a particular way. So, for example, in, our, in, my, in my case, I mean, uh, it's clear that some, some users define their uh, sharing a, a members activity as leisure or enjoying while others and I interviewed others who are defining that the same activity as work so as a kind of uh, work that is very connected to to the, their 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 um, their their life their biography as worker uh, right so but it's not only about meanings. So it's not only about you know uh, the symbology. It's all there are also uh, material elements in the way these activities are performed that indicate how this activity is defined, right? So I also like to point that because it's not only about how people perceive what they do, but it's also the way the the, the activity is performed materially. That is important in the way that the, the, that is defined as work, as leisure, as something uh, entertaining, and uh, and and we need to to do more research on that, and we need to do more empirical and very situated kind of research on that, because uh, these categories are all the time negotiated. They are not clear, uh, and it very they are very context specific. Uh, so, yeah, that is what I wanted to add. And I just to add to the inequality yeah. question, because I think that finance, you know, we, we I, I hope we're not making assumptions that people are making uh, financially able to. And uh, I mean, I spent from one of my focus groups before before the pandemic we did, did in just in the autumn before there was, it was one of the participants who used to go to the library to do all her emails. And I would really like to connect with her and see how she's doing. So I think, you know, the space and place and who's using it. And we had a social justice um, seminar a couple of weeks ago and um, the participant coming in, you know, couldn't link up onto Zoom. So we, you know, was done through the phone call by the things because, you know, you know, the cost of internet, the cost of, you know, what, these infrastructures are not cheap and, um, and many of them assume iPhones. So I think the inequality, and that's where the mundane always signifies our inequalities, whether they be age, gender, ethnicity, social class and others. Thank you, everyone. Thank uh, you, I would, I, uh, yeah. If we've got so a little bit more time, I would invite um, Clara Barrage to speak. I don't, yeah. I don't know if you... Uh, See the option, Clara, to... Uh... I think so. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thanks so much. I, I texted, or I, I sent to the Q&A my question, but I'll, I'll kind of read it. Um, thanks for these wonderful presentations. My question is for Daniel. Um, I, I thought that, uh, you know, thinking about how much 
judgment is passed um, from younger generations to older generations around technology and hearing about the social workers and your reflexive thinking about how you reacted or responded to um, the way that older adults were choosing to use uh, use the platform. I It just seems to me like a really neat uh, opportunity to get at age relations, power, and the role technology plays um, by examining, I think like, like it seems like you are and, and really looking closely at how those those social workers responded who I assume are of a different generation. Um, and then also thinking about how older adults do because I see so much, especially in HCDE and HCI, there's lots of you know introducing of a newer technology. So teaching the older adult how to game and then do that with grandkids. But what about the sort of mundane or the, the way that people are communicating generally? What, what can we learn by talking to them about how they're, you know, how they're thinking and uh, about how the other generation is using it. Um, what can that teach us about power, age relations, and tech? Great question. Thanks, Clara. Maybe I, I see that Mireya wants to give an answer, but maybe Daniel, you can also start because the the question was, I think, originally directed to you. But I, well, one of you maybe can 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 start here. I don't mind, uh, Mireya. You can you can uh, start. Oh no no, you're first. Then, then yeah. I then I Where think about the answer. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, that, because so, the first, yeah. okay, yeah. good. So then, because um, I mean, Clara, you you made it tremendously clear. There is and and Daniel already mentioned that there is a power relationship. There is an assumption about how technology is properly used, and this we found that in in some research projects that everyone considers that they use the technology, the digital technology in the in the appropriate way and the others do it in a wrong way. So again, there, there is this assumption like older individuals should use the technology in a given way. And, and Daniel's example was so clear. It was designed to do whatever and they ended up by appropriating it and changing the, the, the script. However, there's uh, what I wanted to share is, is that what subgroups that are tremendously popular in some European countries allowed to older individuals to interact and decide their rules in groups that are only confirmed by older individuals. So they took out the power relationship about it is gonna be the younger ones who know how this should be used. So they are gonna tell us you don't need to say good morning every morning. You don't need to send the flowers every very morning. And I allow you because I love you because you're my grandma. No. So there are so people of the same age, peers, older peers define how WhatsApp groups work and they define it differently depending on the group. So and I think this is taking out the power relationship from this from these groups. There's different power relationships, but with, him, with peers of the same age being older adults that are defining how these digital environments work. And, and to me, this relates a lot with Daniel's example. Um, so, but I wanted to talk about this power relationship because I find it tremendously interesting. Yeah, maybe Daniel, you can. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a it's a very good point. And in the field, when I, I didn't have the feeling that it was about age, but not only. So it was really about you know the idea of you know a provider. So there's a service there. So they are they are they are working for the the users, and in a way there was uh, also a particular constraint, which is which is technical. So the the, the, the the tablet and the app were designed in a particular way, and uh, and probably was not designed having in mind that you know all the, you know the, the users would would end up like sending uh, tons of memes, but the idea was to uh, promote more uh, kind of uh, conversations through voice, for example, so more like a telephone or something like that. So I think it's it's a it's a what you were, I mean, what Clara was suggesting is also interesting in terms of having that conversation or with, for example, with the workers. And we did that, we did that in terms of, look, look at this practice. These are minimum, minimum practice. We might, we might need to change our, the rules 
or we might we might change we might need to change how the system is designed technically speaking but it, this also involves uh not only considering the age in terms of young and older but also like the kind of work we do here right so we are the experts who are the who are the ones who do the research and provide some insights you are the workers who are providing you know help support things like that they are the managers they are the policy makers they are the designers so and also i think that this also this is also important so to 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 expand probably the discussion because you know it's not only about technology and age but there are issues of uh, expertise you know politics of knowledge in a way this is all very very important and uh, and also in terms of uh, of course class etc but yeah i think it's it's a it's a very relevant uh, issue thank you thanks everybody also and and uh, someone reminds me on on some research and usability problems sometimes uh, when there's a problem between what the technology can and how you use it there seems to be somewhere a, a, a boundary when it's the problem is with the technology so if it's younger users and there's usability problems then it's with the technology and sometimes it becomes a problem for the user and there seems to be a very intricate game around aging going on here as well and yeah. I, I think this really much speaks also to be sort of being sensitive more to well the mundane every day which well also questions the whole notion of who defines what usability is in the first place and this becoming an empirical question in the end. Um, yeah, can I, I, think can I add a, something? Yeah. I, uh, so just a comment on that. I think you, you, you're really right. I mean, uh, it's it's amazing because the the design, even though there's you know the problems. I mean, the the design the technology is really limited, and uh, they had this problem with the memes. Uh, it has never so far uh, challenged in a way in terms of age in terms of because there is there's this, uh, that assumption that you are referring to so it's it's they are problematizing the use of the technology because they are not trained because they are not so tech savvy blah 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 but the, it's really hard to problematize the technology in that case even harder when probably harder than when it is a you know mobile phone used by a younger younger people so i totally agree i think that's a good good point yeah, yeah, and a, and a good good for the line of of inquiry uh, as well. Um, just looking at the time and the question, also I think related to Clara's question, uh, there's another question for Wendy specifically. I think um, maybe I can read it. Uh, like Clara, I'm finding some new insights here on my experiences communicating digitally with friends and relatives through the pandemic. In particular, my 94 year old father in law has taken to communicating with us regularly through Instagram, mostly by liking or commenting on our posts, but also occasionally posting his own. Um, and then the question for Wendy then is could this be another way of exploring visual representations of everyday life? Um, and then the question of what, what this could mean and where, where we can go from there. Um, and maybe, yeah, maybe we can take this also as a wrap up uh, question for this session. Again, and maybe Constance, you can also check with me if, if there are other things we haven't addressed. But Wendy, maybe you can reflect a little bit on that first. Yeah, no, sure. Well, it's quite interesting actually, because I did uh, three focus groups. I was going to do six focus groups just before the pandemic. And now I'm going to do three focus groups on the use of um, everyday mundane media. But, um, and it feels like another world. So I think when you say about your grandfather using Instagram, I think all of us have changed our practices and that may be for different people in different ways. And yeah, I think, um, and, and of course, when you, are, you say about the visual and Instagram, of course, one of the, the huge things is that within the digital is the amount of um, images, that are, visual images that are shared and um, commented on and how we connect with people. So there's many, I think, you know, there's probably lots of different creative ways but I think they definitely will be very interesting to explore the everyday lives of the lived experiences during the lockdown and post the lockdown in the as we've had in the UK and not and I know not everyone's had as many as us but um so you know and see how they how they're experienced how they're experienced and things so yeah absolutely I would like, would like to think a lot more about that but I'm aware of the time I think there's a couple of questions there too yeah. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. Um, Constance, uh, 
what do you think? I, I again with an eye on the time. If we don't have any pressing questions, I think this is a good moment to wrap up. Yeah, we have three left, Thank and what I would suggest is I can make sure to collect these, and I will send them to all of our panelists. And I hope yeah. this is the beginning, not a not an end, right? The beginning of of more conversations about this topic. Yeah, and I I, I have like. Uh, scribbled down a lot of really interesting things. So I think once we go through the material and the recordings from today's meeting, we find a lot of elements that, uh, um, that, that we can take further in our discussion around this mundane in, in aging and technology encounters. So I'd like to thank everybody for being here in particular our great panelists for giving these inspire, inspirational uh, talks and discussions. I'd like to thank Constance and Kim, of course, as well, although she couldn't be here today. I think we all wish her thanks for, for, uh, for now, but um, uh, thanks for, 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 for organizing and keeping us on track here and for preparing this. I think in next steps, uh, Constance and I will probably confer just quickly in the next couple of days and see, well, there's gonna be a recording, probably some, some, some notes on the blog about main key take home messages. And, I guess we'll be back in touch with, uh, with some, some insights from today's workshops. Um, so thanks again. Have a good evening or a good day, depending on where you are <laughs> on, on, on this world. Um, and we are looking forward to meeting you again at some other occasion soon. Be in touch, keeping on the discussion. And please check with the Social German Tech Network or the ACT Project for more information. Become a member. Join our dialogues. Um, I think this is really relevant. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Thanks, Constance. <laughs> Thanks to the panelists. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.